2015, Army. The February 23rd, 2015 meeting of the Planning Board of the Town of Cape Elizabeth come to order. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, the agenda tonight consists of the following uh, approval of the minutes of the previous meeting in January 20. Uh, Peterson Hidden Court Subdivision Amendment. The uh, Srinagaparu Blueberry Bridge Subdivision Amendment. Those are both old business. There's a new business, Brothers Way, Legacy Way, Private Road Amendment. Uh, <coughs> after that will be a uh, discussion of the proposed land use amendments and a public comment uh, at the end. And we will also be discussing the possible rescheduling of the March uh, meeting of the board. Uh, I'd like to thank the members of the public for coming. The first item of business uh, is approval of the minutes. Uh, these have been circulated. Is there, are there any comments, corrections, or observations? Great. I received an email from a member of the public requesting that under the item for Hidden Court, it talks about building lot when really it's supposed to be referencing building envelope. And I don't have a specific page for you. Hidden, hidden the court? Hidden Court. Peterson Hidden Court. Oh, okay. It would have been on page... Building window is that? Is that their? Is that their uh... No, their 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 concern was that there was a reference to lot when in fact it should be window. No. I'm not seeing that problem, mm -hmm. so I withdraw my comment. <clears throat> okay, it's on the top of page two. The comments by Frank Stroud. Okay. Uh, does not want the building lot. That's the last sentence. And it's really the building envelope. The to building be, to be envelope. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Very good. That is true. With that correction, okay. um, do we have a motion to approve the minutes? I'll make a motion that we uh, accept the minutes from the January 20, 2015 meeting as revised. Okay, seconded by Henry. Uh, any discussion on the second the motion? All in favor? Opposed? The motion passes unanimously. <coughs> we will now take up the matter of the Peterson Hidden Court Subdivision Amendment. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, the Hidden Court LLC, which is owned by Natalie and Alexander Peterson, are requesting amendments to a previously approved 1989 subdivision located at 340 Ocean House Road to adjust lot lines, building envelopes, and a separate driveway access rights. <coughs> the application has been considered complete, and the public hearing has been scheduled for this evening. The plan will be reviewed under Section 16-2-5. Uh, of the subdivision ordinance. The procedure will be as follows. The planner will provide a summary of the project within the context of the town regulations. The applicant will summarize changes that have been made since the last meeting. The public will then have an opportunity to speak. Uh, once the public discussion is over, the board will discuss uh, the application. So Maureen, would you like to um, provide the summary? Sure. So this is an application for uh, changing t the lot lines of two lots in a four-lot subdivision. Um, you have the memo in front of you. This is located in the RA district, and the changes to the lot lines are um, well within our minimum lot size requirements. Uh, what you've received in the last couple of hours has been a flurry of new information or reviewing of old information. This subdivision was approved in January of 1989, and with that approval, there were five conditions of approval. Subsequently, there was an amendment to the approval in June of 1989, and none, almost none of the approvals from the June approval dealt with the conditions from the January approval. 
And then there was a third amendment, in, a second amendment or a third approval in 1995. Again, the amendment in 1995 did not address the conditions on the original 1989 approval in January. So I received a request from a planning board member to look at the original approvals and I've sent you and you also have in front of you tonight and the applicant also has received a copy of the January 17, 1989 minutes with the approval, the June 89 minutes with the approval, and the 1995 minutes with the approval. I then reviewed the plan, and um, what became apparent is that there were conditions imposed on the 1989 January approval which are still hanging out there. And um, some of the, well, at least one of the conditions addresses the concern the board raised at the last meeting about the access to what I have started calling the loop driveway, which starts out at Route 77, loops into the stone house, goes south, connects up with the garden house lot, and then goes back out to Route 77. So I spoke with the applicant, and it appears that one of the ways that the board could consider addressing the concerns you've raised about the maintenance of the loop driveway as a public safety access point, and also address some of the conditions imposed in January of 89, would be to have this project include a standard road access, road maintenance agreement, which is the typical kind of agreement the board does all the time with private access way permits. Uh, so what I have done is uh, we've spoken to the applicant. The applicant apparently would like to proceed this evening instead of putting this off for a month to clean up some details. So I have um, given you an optional uh, approval motion, uh, which lays out a fairly detailed condition about the public access, uh, the public safety issues, and also provides um, a curing of these issues hanging out there from the January 89 approval. And in my opinion, some of those conditions from 1989 related to items that really aren't typically within the scope of a town subdivision review. They're more within the scope of private agreements that are entered into by individual lot owners. So uh, one of the things that's being presented to you tonight is this option to use this alternative motion with um, proposals to deal with the emergency access issue and to clean up anything that might be a title problem lingering from that January 89 approval. So I think I can stop there. Thank you. Uh, we'll hear next from the applicant's representative, Mr. Moore. Good evening, board members, Chair Curry, Stephen Moore on behalf of Hidden Court LLC. Um, unfortunately, Alexander couldn't be here this evening. He's out on business travels, and Natalie's tied up with child care for the two kids. So I'm here, and hopefully I can walk the board through this and make some sense out of it. With the chair's permission, I actually have copies of the plan that reflect what's up on that uh, projector, but also what was put in the cover letter to you last Friday. I sent a cover letter in that talked about the additions of notes. So with your permission, I'll hand that out, but it's nothing more than what is being shown on the... To take us back to January, at the last meeting, the board went through the application <clears throat> and talked about a series of text changes, some clarifications on abutters, some rewording of notes, the addition of the view easement, line weights, hatch patterns, and a general cleanup in terms of text and deed calls of the plan. <clears throat> and when we submitted at the end of January, we submitted a plan that had those 19 changes in the plan. None of them affected the proposed lot line changes or the building envelope on the garden lot. They were really cures to a series of changes in the text. And as you can see in the plan that came in today that I have on the board, 
It's the same that you saw in January with respect to that view easement, which the board wanted to show on this plan, which is, um, I can't quite get that, which is the gray shaded area right there. Where we had a fixed dimension from the deed call, we put that on the plan. But in terms of the actual information regarding that view easement, the best we could get was take that 60 foot dimension and then using the original exhibit out of the deed, put that view easement on there. The intent of that view easement was to describe the area in which the garden lot had clearing rights over the land of Hidden Court. Because this portion of that Hidden Court property is now going to the garden lot, much of that view easement no longer has relevance. The only place it has relevance is right there because in the language, Hidden Court is prohibited from putting obstructions in that piece of the triangle that goes out onto the Hidden Court lot. So as of that submission, that's a set of changes which you've seen in plans and in submission that clean up a lot of those, um, all of those issues from the end of January pointed out by the board at the January meeting. Subsequent to that, as Maureen noted, we had conversations about improving and cleaning up the note on the vegetative clearing, which is here, and addressing the emergency access between these two properties. And what we did is we took the text that came from Maureen with respect to vegetative clearing outside of the lot, used it identically, but we did add in the third line a specific reference to the ability to maintain these existing gardens and structures. No expansion, just preservation and maintenance of those, the two little summer houses and the gardens because they're outside the building window. <clears throat> that same information is repeated again in a slightly abbreviated form there, but as you can see in the plans I handed out, this text is what the board has seen before with respect to vegetation preservation outside of the building envelopes. Uh, it's very important to note, because the abutters have talked about this both on the record as well as off the record, the building window on the garden lot is slightly smaller than the original approved building window that was put on the 89, the 289 amendments. So the change, the only change is in response to the board's concern about buffering, this setback went from 30 to 50. So we've shrunk that building window slightly along the back part of that lot. So the building window and the building envelope remain identical. The key changes are the shift in the two lot areas, which is this parcel comes from Hidden Court to the garden lot, this parcel comes from uh, garden lot to Hidden Court, and then there's a little shift in that area right there. So in terms of those bigger issues with respect to changes in the subdivision plan, lot line adjustments, vegetative preservation, I believe that we have those all in sync with what the board had been talking about. I think the big issue really is the issue of the emergency access and the interconnectivity between the two lots. We read the fire chief's comments. We had talked to Maureen and in response to those comments on the plan that we submitted, we had shown that emergency access turnaround on the garden lot right there. And that's uh, turnaround compliant with the standards, both in terms of uh, horizontal layout, turning radii, to the uh, standards that are in your ordinance. We also added a detail here that shows that blown up for the geometry layout. And then we added two notes about the construction buildup there, because that's what was being asked of us to make that compliant with um, your ordinance. We added a note in here whoops, that talks about the need to keep that driveway 
interconnected, the need for the two lots to allow emergency access to occur. And again, this was put forward on Friday before we had this latest round of discussions today about that emergency access. Our attempt in adding that note was to say both Hidden Court and the Garden Lot understand that we need to provide mutual access between the two and provide connectivity through those gates. So we've had the note about leaving the gates that are between the two open, which are right here, <clears throat> and then making sure that both driveways are kept plowed and clear and left open. After the discussions today with Maureen, we had a brief conversation with Maureen and then myself with the clients and their attorney about tabling this to clean up this emergency access. Um, what really pushes me before you tonight is the fact that there's a buyer that wants to purchase Hidden Court and the Petersons don't want to sign the purchase and sale until they have a sense from this board of the uh, issues around this emergency access. Um, I'll even put a finer point on it. The discussions, one of the discussions today was whether or not the PNS could be executed and closed inside of the 30-day appeal period from the board. So I just offer that as anecdotal information for what brings me here because typically, as the board knows, we want to resolve this before getting this before the board. But I bring this tonight because I think what we're proposing to do to bring resolution to this is as follows. We have no issue with executing that road maintenance agreement, period, just as it's written. Um, the buyers and the sellers both recognize that's to their benefit to get that in place. As we looked at this site today and looked at the driveways and the roads, I think all of you know that there are gates. There are four gates, one, two, three, and four. Um, the three outlying gates all have a 12-foot, one-and-a-half-inch clear opening. The one gate up in the middle has a 12-foot, six-inch opening. As we looked at your standards and looked at some of the chief's concerns and then looked at the existing road geometry, what we were able to figure out was that we could, in fact, meet a 16-foot emergency travelway standard without clearing the major trees, without tearing up existing vegetation, and without having to actually affect the existing gates. And what I'm proposing this evening to the board is that we would, in fact, come back with an amendment that spells out in notes and then in graphics on this plan that we will have in a 16-foot wide emergency vehicle access over both driveways, including the loop up through. And that we would not just have the one turnaround here, but we put a second emergency turnaround on the hidden court lot right there. So we can accommodate the chief's request for full-size turnarounds compliant with that diagram, the 40-foot legs with the 20-foot radius that meet the standards of the WB40 vehicle. So we can meet that. We went out and actually field checked this today. And we've identified the three areas where we need to make some slight changes here, oops, sorry, here, here, and there to get the WB40 radii changes. So I can say to the board with confidence tonight, we know we can meet that WB40 turning radius standard and meet the 16 foot width without damaging any of the historic fabric or the landscape that's out there. And so that's really the issue that I put back before the board. And again, I apologize for bringing that to the board in this form at this hour. But based on what we've been through in terms of discussions today, that's what we've been able to do to meet that concern about emergency access. So I think between those two, with the 16-foot wide travel width, making those three changes on the existing horizontal geometry to meet the turning radii, and uh, putting in the road maintenance agreement, 
we've been able to address what we see as the emergency access issues around the subdivision. And with that, I think I'll turn it back to the board for the public hearing. I've really hit sort of the high points and haven't talked a lot about the pieces that brought us here, which were the lot line shifts. But I appreciate the board's giving me a little bit of uh, freedom there to go off page and talk about those other issues. Thank you. <coughs> Excuse me, are there any uh, questions from the board for Mr. Moore before we open it to the public that would be useful? To Elaine? Can you clarify that le leaving in place all of the existing gates at all points you can maintain 16 foot access or are there some places where it will remain pinched down to 12? Only at the gates will it be pinched down to the 12 foot at one inch. At all four gates. So how does that work? Because of the road, because of the drive geometry, you're able to get through those gates straight. You can get through those gates in a straight fashion on one, two, and three. Right here, we need to widen out on the garden lot side of that to set that up so the equipment can get through that on the straight. And the chief commented about this in his memo that he recognizes those pinch points. Um, to put it on a very fine point, the Petersons are absolutely reluctant to take the gates down. They're a historic feature. They're part of that original fabric. And the Petersons feel very strongly that preservation of those gates is integral to the preservation of Hidden Court. And with the Chief's comments about being able to navigate the gates because they're on a straight, they felt comfortable bringing this forward. That answers my question. Thank you. Thank you. Um, the gravel drive that's on the garden slot? Yes. Uh, I, I can't recall who drive past there often. Is the first 50 feet paved? Or is it all gravel? It's all gravel. Okay. Um, I'd have to run by Maureen about our standards on um, paving part of that as it reaches a public um, road. Is that something you would be against? or? Uh, no. Again, we're going to work through that detail with the staff. If the staff feels it needs to be paved, we'll pave it. The, the, Ordinance requires the first 40 feet to be paved. Is it 40? Uh, I believe, Maureen, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe it's 40 feet. Let me uh, do the public piece of this, and you'll be available for more discussion. Absolutely. Uh, <coughs> at this point, we'll open the meeting for uh, public comment. Uh, those who'd like to speak, if you could come one at a time to the podium, give your name and your address uh, for the record, and we'd like to hear what you have to say. Are there any members of the public who wish to be heard? Okay, there, being, there being none, I'll close the public part of the meeting um, and open the matter to discussion by the board. Um, we could probably first continue to pepper Mr. Moore with questions here and see if we can answer all of our questions, Henry. It failed ours. Um, I don't suppose there's a house on it at the moment, is there? Yes. There is not a house on the garden lot. Field house lot. Field house lot. Yes, I'm sorry, there is a house on the there is a house on the field house lot that was recently sold to Fairwinds LLC. And there is a house on the caretakers lot. So but this this plan doesn't um, reference any access. So would that come off Route seventy seven or would you take a Hat off the gravel road, or would you take a dog leg off the gravel road to get to field house? Um, both the field house lot and the and the caretaker lot have their own driveways. Okay. Right now, the field house drive comes through here and sweeps into a turnaround, and the caretaker's drive is right there. So those okay. two drives and houses are in place. Uh, Elaine. I'm sorry, can you show me again where the fourth gate is? I'm looking at the plan in front of me, and I've only found three. There's one gate at the entrance, which is right near the intersection stop. Oh, there is. OK, I don't see that on the plan. There's a gate right there, a gate right there, and one gate right there. OK, the, they're just the ones at the intersection I can't see on the plan. It sits, it sits literally under the property line. That ah. particular gate is right on the property line, the lot line. Thank you. I have a question. Sorry. 
Henry? What, why? Is it aesthetics that you want to keep the gates there, or if they serve no practical purpose if they're always going to be open? The notion is not wanting to take anything apart that's part of that original historic fabric. So an is, it's an aesthetic value? It, it, it is. It's, a, it's really hewing to that original sense of what Hidden Court was and not wanting to disrupt that. But they're going to be functional, so you could, if somebody wanted to, close them, I guess, assume. Um, these gates will remain functional. This gate, this has no gates on it. It's just a set of columns. On this particular one, the idea is we're going to pull those gates open and actually lock them in the open position. Thank you. Oh. <coughs> Everybody, uh, Steve, one question. You said three of the four gates, the fire equipment on the straight can fit through. The fourth gate, which the Petersons do not want to move the gate posts themselves, what is the width of that and what, how do you see the fire equipment getting through there? That's, that's the one gate that actually is 12 feet, 6 inches wide, clear. And the only way, because it's on a curve, mm -hmm. we actually have to widen out on the garden side of the lot on the driveway on the garden side to get that road geometry out wide enough so that the truck can get through straight. But it will 12 foot 6 inches, the fire truck is less than 12 foot 6 inches, I take it in width. And so with the widening of the road and the straightening of the geometry, that's exactly what all we have the to gates, do. Will, how, how much clearance is there? Um, how much clearance? Beyond the, coming into the gate, we're over 30 feet wide for clearance on the hidden court side. No, I mean at the point of the gate. When the fire truck's trying to get through the gate, how much, how much clearance on either side to the post would there be? Maureen is acting like she. I can attest that I was out there with the fire chief, and he got a tape measure out, and I held one end, and he held the other end, and he measured the width of the gates, and he said, I can get the ladder truck through this gate. Yeah, the ladder can get through. He can get it through. It's, it's when he has to make a turn while he's going through the gate that he ends up yeah. with a problem. But in the winter particularly, the snow clearance will have to be such that it's cleared to out to the post. They're going to have to Correct. be about snow clearance. Right. Correct. Okay. Which will be covered in that maintenance agreement. Any other questions from the board? You don't have a drawing of that widened road, do you? That's not shown on the plan. No, I, we went through and did that in the office at about 4.30 today after we did our field measurements. Based on the discussions with Maureen, my thinking was I had to bring that back to the staff and go through that with the staff to get their approval, both from the chief, from the engineering, and from Maureen, to demonstrate that we can meet that standard because we're agreeing to that condition that we'll meet that standard of the... WB40 turning radii. And did the fire chief give you a sense of how many feet of straight roadway are required? Um, we didn't, I didn't talk about that specifically with the chief, but we used the WB40, which requires 40 feet coming in and 40 feet going out being straight, so a total of 80 feet. And you're going to have 80 feet of straight roadway going through that gate. It, it looks like you would completely relocate the road to get those. Um, we have to widen the the trick on this is widening the incoming lane on that particular gate to the west. So we have to widen the incoming lane to the west by about seven feet. And then as you get on the garden lot, we have to widen the easterly side of that lane by about nine feet to allow that to set up. If that's making any sense to anybody here. No. Sorry. Yes, I see. I'd have to see, see a graphic picture of it. Because he doesn't have to turn. Yeah. Great. If the board is willing to allow this to move forward tonight, the proposed condition requires the applicant to prepare drawings for our town engineer to confirm will accommodate the letter truck. Yes, I would be more inclined to do that if I had a sense more specifically what the standards we were looking for. Like the, a maximum of 
12 feet of straight passage, a distance of 80 feet. Sure. The, the standard is really that B40 vehicle, and that's a classification out of the Institute of Transportation Engineers. I think that's the right one. And what we did many years ago when we were trying to create a standard in the subdivision ordinance is to pick a vehicle that most closely approximated the ladder truck. And that's the classification B-40. And it has a certain turning radius. And so what our engineers would do is whenever the applicant submits, they will check to make sure that that particular class of vehicle can make that turning radius. So there really isn't. We're talking about a straight portion, though, not a turning portion. But there's the turning the, radius but it's, both. But it's both because it's just like um, if you have a turnaround, if you have a very narrow road and you have to come into a turnaround, the ladder truck can use both lanes of a road because it's an emergency vehicle. So if you have a 22-foot wide road, the turning radius to turn into a turnaround can be very small because you've got a lot of room to turn around in. If you've got a narrow road, then you need a wider turning radius in order to fit the ladder truck. So it doesn't matter what the width of the road is, the turning radius will grow in size if the road is narrower. And I'm suggesting that if the board is comfortable moving this forward, there is a very specific standard that the town engineer uh, would check. The applicant will be required to come up with an engineer drawing to show it. One way to look at it is if the turning radius is too tight, you're going to bang the back of the truck into the gate post. So you're going to modify the gate. So I don't think the fire chief is going to go for that. Right. I was going to say, um, I'm okay with moving this forward because condition number one, the last uh, phrase does say review and approved by the town engineer. And so we're holding them to that standard. They won't be able to come back and say, well, we didn't like what the engineer said on this point or that point. We're holding them to it. There won't be any negotiation. Um, they've added some notes here that um, we're in, we were going to require that. Uh, it was going to be condition number two. They've already added that. Um, this is a really good plot now to be posted uh, onto the, uh, with the uh, Cumberland County Registry of Deeds. Um, but I, I feel okay going forward with this, and so I would move forward. With the chair's permission, I've done a very, don't let other people look at this. Mitch? I apologize. That's a crude drawing of trying to demonstrate how do you take a curve and make it flat straight. Yeah, it'll work. But the notion is we, we, we checked on those radii today. My wonderful people that dug the snow out. Um, so we, we know that we can actually make that work. I wasn't comfortable coming up here and talking about this tonight unless we, in fact, knew we could make that horizontal geometry work. Elaine. I actually think the condition that's stated here is not correct because it calls for a 16-foot wide travel way, when in fact it's not a 16-foot wide travel way. It narrows to 12 feet at the gates, and on either side of it, I assume it's not an abrupt 12 feet, but there's some tapering in and out of those gates. So I actually think this condition is not adequate. I also think that it's... The first sentence says a road maintenance agreement in a form acceptable to the town, and then it says, continues to say what the road maintenance agreement has to provide. And in fact, we're looking for a lot more than what's specified. So I think we need to clarify here that we need a road maintenance agreement in standard form providing for snow removal to maintain road clearance and everything else a road maintenance agreement provides. And in addition, we need these specific things. So it's absolutely clear that we're not just looking for what's here, particularly since you know we know we're in the middle of a purchase and sale negotiation, and the final language of this agreement could potentially hold up a sale of property. So it's going to be a potentially very tense and contentious situation when it comes to doing the language. So I think we need to be abundantly clear so that the staff and the town engineer are not 
able to be um, pushed beyond what they feel comfortable because people are waiting at a table for a closing. I, I would I ask a oh. quick question. So is there stuff in one, in the, uh, item one here that you think is not covered? Yeah. The fact that the road is only 12 feet as it goes through the gates, the fact that that 12 feet needs at all times to remain, that all of the gates, not just the one gate shown, need to make, remain open and unlocked at all times, that all of the, the entire road width, including up to 12 feet through all of the gates, needs to be cleared and free of snow at all times, not six or eight hours after a snowfall. Because we're so narrow here, I think those things we need to see specified in the agreement, and I think, in fairness to the people going to a closing, they and their attorneys need to know that quite explicitly right up front. This was, I'll, I'll be part of the bad guy here, because Marine and I talked about this, and this is sort of a compromise between having a kind of a blank check for approval of an agreement later without specifics, which I think probably wouldn't do your clients a lot of good, and trying to negotiate all the fine detail of this agreement at this meeting <clears throat> and, and, and put it in the uh, condition itself. So uh, I, I take Elaine's point, but I'm wondering whether it's worth getting that much detail going and perhaps we could add a provision saying that it's understood that this agreement will have to satisfy the town on, and then perhaps some generic language as to the passability of the road at all times. And I, I apologize. I think that um, if I remember Fallander is correct that at 12 feet, 12 feet is where the gate was. When I said road maintenance agreement, it, it, it's not in the motion, but we have a model road maintenance agreement. And I was, in my mind, referencing the model road maintenance agreement, which is in the standard practices, we get that model agreement that our attorney has approved. We give it to an applicant. They put their names on it and make other adjustments. We get it back and we review it. I have already sent that model agreement to uh, Mr. Moore, and that agreement does cover the snow removal and the overall maintenance of the road. So. Um, I was thinking the overall maintenance, we'd already deal with with the road agreement, but specific things like the width of the road typically are on the plan. And if the board wants to move ahead tonight, it seemed like it would be safer to make sure it's in the maintenance agreement because it's not on the plan. And to the board, we did take the model road agreement and share that with our clients today which is part of the discussion this afternoon, specifically about all the fine-grained details in terms of the exact issues that were just talked about, snow plowing, vegetation trimming, thinning, clearing, keeping that passage open at all seasons. There's a passage about enforcement and enforcement responsibilities that each lot owner has that enforcement responsibility, but the town does have that capability to come in and those costs would then be incurred by the lot owners. It has a non-waivability standard. It has a life that lives beyond these particular lot owners, so this runs with the land. And I think that, I think those, but it's, it's the standard model which I did share with the Petersons and we discussed again today to make sure that everybody understood exactly what we were entering into. One other comment, if I may, not on the road itself, but there is a, um, in the 89 approval, there was reference to a bunch of deeds and deed restrictions, which I believe are more in the category that Maureen mentioned about things we don't normally look at, uh, view easements, rights of passage amongst the lots and so forth. <coughs> Excuse me. And the requirement was that these restrictions be approved, uh, reviewed by the uh, town's uh, legal counsel and then approved by the board, which was never done. Uh, it seemed, I think, to uh, uh, Maureen and myself, that doing something with that, uh, these unapproved conditions made sense, 
they shouldn't be left to dangle on the record. I think perhaps your buyer of your lot might look at that and be concerned about the state of the title. So we have in our proposed motion, if we go forward on this tonight, uh, a provision that talks about the um, conditions of these uh, A through E and the 89 planning board will be deleted. The things that we want to pay attention to will be dealt with currently in this approval. Some of these extraneous deed restrictions will essentially be um, taken out of out of the game. We we had discussed that this afternoon, and I spoke about that with again the Petersons, who concur with that wholeheartedly because of that exact issue of a potential title defect. Yeah, those those restrictions have a life of their own, as between the property owners. Right. They're, they will not be part of the part of this approval. approval. Okay. Just for the record, I want everybody to be uh, clear on that. Um, I think we're at a point now where we should get some kind of a, a sense of the board on whether we move forward with the approval um, as it's been in the draft without the addition of a lot of uh, additional specificity which Elaine preferred or perhaps assuming that the approval by the town planner and the engineer will suffice. Do, does anybody, do you want to go forward or do you want to build up this language further? Uh, as I say before, I don't mind going forward. I'm also very open to anything that Elaine would like to add. Um, that's sure. Yeah, I agree. I'd like to move forward, but anything Elaine wants to add would be fine. Yes, I'm in, I'm in favor of moving forward, um, and I've got a couple of ideas to help Elaine just add a couple of phrases to clarify. Yeah, I move forward, but I think that the gates ought to be mentioned in the in note one that the gates should be permanently opened and locked in position. You mentioned one of them being locked, but you didn't mention the others. Locked open. The intent of the applicant is to still keep the two gates that face on to 77 being a motor operated gate. Oh, uh, The interior gates are not an issue to be open, but the two gates or the internal gates. The internal does gates. Does the fire chief have access to the? Is, is there a Knox box or? There's not a Knox box. There's a code that the chief has. Okay, so he has access. They also both gates are designed because we were involved with the mechanisms. They're designed with a breakaway cotter pin. So if there's a power shortage and the gate cotter pin can be either cut or snapped off, and then the gates manually pushed open. I don't know if you want to make a note to that on your modification. We, we have, um, for us, I think you all have a uh, model vote that's been drawn up. Um, I would point out that paragraph two will drop out because that language is now on the plan itself. And Elaine, you probably are best equipped to reconcile the language in note one with your uh, some compromise between you and the rest of the the board on, on adding additional specifics. Would you like to sure. propose a motion including, I'd rather do it that way than have this done and then have to do amendments and so forth. Yep, I think I've got it. Okay. Yep. So do we have a motion uh, on the applicant's um, applicant? I'd like to make Wait. a motion. Findings of fact, Hidden Court LLC owned by Natalie and Alexander Peterson are requesting amendments to the previously approved 1989 Hidden Court subdivision located at 340 Ocean House Road to adjust lot lines and building envelopes and separate driveway access rights which requires review under section 1625 amendments to previously approved subdivisions. Two, the fire chief has approved, has provided comments regarding emergency <coughs> access. Three, the subdivision plan includes provisions for extensive vegetated buffers. Four, the January 1989 subdivision approval includes conditions of approval that are no longer applicable to the subdivision plan. Five, the applicant has substantially addressed the standards of the subdivision ordinance, section 16.3.1. Therefore, be it ordered that based on the plans and materials submitted and the facts presented, 
the application of Hidden Court LLC, owned by Natalie and Alexander Peterson, for amendments to the previously approved 1989 Hidden Court subdivision, located at 340 Ocean House Road, to adjust lot lines and building envelopes and separate driveway access rights for lots R2-4-1 and R2-4-3 be approved subject to the following conditions. That the applicant provide a signed road maintenance, one, that the applicant provide a signed road maintenance agreement for the loop driveway connecting Route 77 located on the Stone House and Garden House lots, plural, in a form acceptable to the town attorney and the town manager. The town road, the road maintenance agreement shall include all standard provisions of the model agreement as provided to the applicant and shall further provide for a minimum 16 foot traveled way with a minimum 12 foot travel access way through the four gates on the, uh, on the property, an adequate turning radius for emergency vehicles, paren B-40 class vehicles, and two turnarounds one located on each lot as specified in the subdivision ordinance. Um, the, all of the four gates located on the lot shall be accessible to the fire chief at all times and the two internal gates shall remain open at all times. Where improvements to the loop driveway are needed to provide an adequate turning radius and to construct a turnaround, plans shall be submitted depicting radius and turnaround improvements for review and approval by the town engineer. Two, that conditions A through E on the January 17, 1989 planning board approval be deleted. Three, that the plans be revised and submitted to the town planner for review and approval prior to recording the subdivision flat. Second. Okay, we have a motion made and seconded. Do we have any further discussion on the motion? Just one question, Maureen. Uh, on item three, the plans, should there be and agreements be revised, or is that not necessary? Um. Yeah, you could say plans, I mean, usually plans and materials kind of is the whole thing, but. No, that's. Okay. <clears throat> so you're proposing a friendly amendment to number three to the plans and materials? <coughs> yeah, I was thinking plans and agreements. Plans, plans you know, and agreements, we're, I'm sorry. The agreement is really at the heart of yes. planning this yep. problem, not the plan. So. That's fine. Yes. Can I ask one question? I, just about what I said. I think that I asked that access to the all of the gates be available to the fire chief at all times, and I'm wondering whether it was more appropriate access to fire department emergency vehicles instead of the fire chief personally. Absolutely, yeah. I think it's the intent was the vehicular passage. Right. Why not just say fire department? Okay. And you can give this in Hiromi and yes. form for the yeah. direction. Fire department, I guess, is. For just emergency vehicles? That way police can go up there? Well, ambulances is the same problem. What about an ambulance? Well, the, the, the rescue department is under the fire department. And honestly, I think if that, the fire department has access, everybody else is going to be good. Yep. OK. Right. So fire right. department instead of fire chief. OK, we have the motion uh, made, seconded. Uh, with a minor adjustment, and uh, if there is no further discussion, ask for a show of hands of all those in favor. Opposed? And the motion carries unanimously. Thank you. Thank you. I, I appreciate you taking the time tonight and helping us work through it. Yes. <laughs> Yes, 
those notes, they didn't all get in. Some of them did, and some of them didn't. The uh, Were you able to load this up? Excuse me, the next order of uh, item of business is the Shranga um, uh, Varapu Liberty Ridge Subdivision Amendment. Um, Mr. and Mrs. Shranga Varapu are requesting an amendment to a previously approved subdivision to replant a vegetated butter buffer located on a lot located at 10 Blueberry Road that was removed in error. The application will be reviewed for compliance with section 16-2-5 amendments to previous uh, approved subdivisions. Um, before we go on, uh, Joe has a comment he'd like to make. Okay, so after the last time they presented, I um, approached the Strong of Arapus and offered to help them with uh, drafting up their plan, uh, just as a favor. Uh, I've known them for quite a while. And um, it quickly became apparent to me that they really needed the help of a landscape architect and not me. So I recommended that. And um, I don't think I need to recuse myself from this. I, I feel like I can be completely impartial. But I just wanted to let the board know and see if you had any comments. Uh, thank you. Any comments from the board? No. No. I think that's fine. Yeah. That's fine. Um, yeah. I, I see no reason. Uh, thank you for the disclosure, and uh, I think we can proceed. Uh, the procedure uh, will be <coughs> as follows. Uh, Maureen will provide a summary of the project in the context of town regulations. Um, the applicant will uh, present uh, the project um, <coughs> excuse me, to the planning board. Um, there will be an opportunity for the public to speak on the issue of completeness. Uh, we will make a finding of completeness uh, or not. We will also decide whether or not there should be a site walk. And uh, if the applicant wishes to see it happen, uh, we can proceed to vote on the granting or not of the application or move it on to the next uh, hearing for final approval. Um, we can cross that bridge in a minute, but I want you to know we can either cut it off at completeness tonight, or if the applicant wants, we can, if, and if the board is comfortable, we can go on to do final approval. Uh, Maureen, would you like to do the summary? Sure. So this project is in the RC district, and I just want to suggest the board cast their memory back to the subdivision standards that you spent so much time rewriting last year. One of the standards of review is buffering. So for a new subdivision, you have to provide buffering. This subdivision, the Blueberry Ridge subdivision, had a buffering plan that included a combination of existing vegetation, new plantings, and fencing. And uh, this applicant removed some of that buffering that was required as part of the subdivision approval. So in order to cure that error, they need to come back to the board and propose an amendment to the sub original subdivision approval, and you're only looking at the buffering. So anytime someone asks for an amendment, you only look at the subdivision standards of review that apply to that particular amendment. So this is an amendment to the previously approved subdivision, specifically looking at the buffering. Any questions? I have a question. Is that, that buffering to this particular site, or does it apply to the whole subdivision? The, the applicant has only removed buffering on their own property. So, this would so be I think amendment. it would be very, very difficult for the board to determine that they were going to be looking at amendments to offering off of this lot. So it should specifically refer to this. Okay. Uh, thank you, Maureen. We will next hear from the applicant's representative, sure. uh, Pat Carroll. My name is Pat Carroll. I'm with Carroll Associates, and we're landscape architects, been hired by the applicant to uh, 
uh, prepare these buffering plans and present them to the board. Um, on the screen behind you, you'll see um, this is the first sheet of the, sheet of the application. This is the existing uh, property plan with the, with the existing house on it. Uh, as part of the subdivision that was done in 2002, I believe it is, uh, there was, and this continued further to the east here, but there's about a 50 foot stretch of, of the, the rear yard that's 10 feet wide by 50 feet long that was designated on the subdivision plat as a no-cut buffer. Um, there, were, there were other trees that were kind of located, existing trees that were located within the yard, and, um, but there was within that 10-foot no disturb buffer zone, I think, is, is the issue where uh, the applicants were found to be in violation of the subdivision. Um, approved subdivision. So that's, that's really the area we're concentrating on. Uh, this is a, a photo of the house here. Uh, this is the rear yard. This is taken from this corner looking this way. There's a very large uh, maple tree that's here and several other trees. Those, those, there's about four or five existing uh, deciduous trees and, and I think there's four evergreen trees that are still remaining in the, in the rear yard. This, for your information, is, uh, is taken from the actual subdivision plan itself. This is the lot, lot 15. Uh, it, it fronts, or it actually butts up against two neighbors that are, I believe this is the South Portland line here. And um, some of you may have been on the board when, when this went through. This was, no, just Maureen. <laughs> um, but uh, there, was, there was a lot of discussion at the time, and uh, Mrs. Bumstead, who lives in this house right here, uh, at the time voiced some concerns about buffering, and that I believe is the reason why. If you look on the drawing to the right, there was a there was a no disturb buffer zone that was that was implemented on the subdivision plan, um, basically to satisfy some of her concerns. So, in addition to the no disturb zone, there were a series of uh, trees that were planted along here. I think there were, the plan sh indicates that there were, there were three hemlock to be located within here, four to five feet high, and I believe there were, there were several kind of pines that were located continuously along the rest of the rear lot line. But again, these were not, um, these were not indicated on the plan as part of that no disturb buffer zone, but they were part of the subdivision landscape plan. Um, this is a blow up of the rear yard, and again, this is that large maple that you saw earlier. Uh, there's, there's a clump of three spruce trees here. There's another maple here, some other deciduous trees. I think these are maple or oak and a hemlock here. These dots on here indicate the trees that were uh, accidentally removed. Well, they were removed, but they, at the time, the applicants were unaware that there was a a landscape buffer requirement in this zone. So, um, the, in effect, there were six trees that were removed within that 10-foot buffer zone. Three of those trees um, exceeded the size requirement that that is part of the subdivision requirement. So, there was a there was a requirement that says that any any tree over two inches in diameter at breast height (DBH) diameter at breast height. I had to had to be uh, preserved and and uh, could not be removed. And uh, we've noted three of those trees that came out of here actually exceeded that. Three of the six. The other three, uh, we believe, were smaller than two inches in diameter at breast height. They were the stump itself measures three inches in diameter, and that's at the ground. So we don't know what 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 it was at breast height, but we can assume that. Those trunks tapered somewhat and were probably less than two inches at, um, at breast height. This is the proposed plan, buffering plan. And what we're, what we're proposing to do is maintain the existing trees that are there, the existing maples, the existing spruce, maples and hemlock on this side and fill in along the back with, um, with an evergreen tree. We've, we're proposing a white spruce 
and, um, and then fill in with a couple of uh, clump birches that would fill in, in as a foreground tree for, for the applicants. So we believe that the, the white spruces will fill in and provide a very strong, probably a better buffer than was ever there before. And, um, and they're fast growing, they're shade tolerant, and, um, and that the, the birches that will grow up taller, a little bit taller, they're started out a little bit taller, and uh, they will actually work to uh, buffer or screen uh, the applicant's house from the, from the abutting neighbor. Um, so that's, that's really our approach here. On the left-hand side here, um, again, there's, this is really the only usable rear yard that the, that the applicant has. These are very tiny lots, um, and there's not much backyard space, and so uh, the, we're proposing it right now to, to leave this as lawn area. Um, as part of a later phase, uh, the applicants are proposing to carry a uh, screen fence, wood screen fence, all the way along the rear yard here. Um, but that's, uh, I, don't, I don't believe fences are actually um, um, regulated by the, by, the, by the town. I think fences, my understanding is fences, anybody can build a fence without a permit. So um, but the intent is to go ahead this spring with the planting itself and then follow up probably next year or so or as funds uh, become available for with the, with the wood fencing. These are just standard details that show uh, how the deciduous trees would be planted, how the uh, evergreen trees would be planted, and a typical detail for the wood stockade fence. These are some photos we included that, uh, in case you're not uh, familiar with what these tree species would be, this is a, this is a white fir. It's a, it's a native tree that uh, is fairly narrow in stature, uh, fast growing, and again, like I said, it's, it does accommodate some shade, which those larger maples in the rear yard and the house do, do um, cast a fair amount of shade. Uh, this is, this is a uh, paper birch. We're proposing a um, cultivar of that that's very disease resistant. Um, it seems to do well here, much better than uh, the earlier paper birches that, uh, that you, everybody thinks about 20 years ago. Um, so we think, you know, with, with the evergreen trees as a backdrop against the property line and the birches kind of in front of that, that it's really going to create a pretty nice backyard uh, for the applicants and, um, and also a, a good buffer from the neighbors. And this is a photo simulation we did. You can see here, and maybe the, with the lights on, it's a little more difficult, but you can see uh, with, the, with the evergreen trees at the backdrop and a couple of birch trees in here, how it really does begin to kind of create a pretty nice screen and buffer uh, from both sides. So that's our, that's our proposal. Um, I guess I'm encouraged to hear that you may you'd be willing to consider this for final approval tonight. Um, that would be in everybody's best interest, I think, and um, we would, we would uh, encourage the board to kind of consider that. We did, I think, I, I submitted to Maureen a couple of emails from uh, the applicants of Butters, and uh, I believe uh, Mrs. Bumstead is here tonight. I don't know if she's gonna talk or not, but uh, it seems like they're both somewhat encouraged by, by this approach, so. Uh, with that, I think I'll open it up to questions. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Carroll. Uh, we will be, uh, the public will have a chance to comment on the issue of completeness. Before we do that, do board members have any questions for Mr. Carroll on the issue of completeness that might be helpful to the public before they speak? Okay, there being none, we will open the public comment part of this. Um, Application hearing, uh, does the public wish to be heard on subject completeness? If you please give your name and your uh, address. Um. Good evening, thank you for the opportunity to speak. My name is Lee Bumstead, it's Ms. Bumstead by the way. Yeah, and I live at 58 Gowdy Street in South Portland. Yes, 
And it's an oak tree. It's a great big oak tree, actually, not a maple, the biggest one. Um, I'm, I'm heartened to see um, that uh, my neighbors have gotten the landscape architect involved, and, uh, and I'm delighted to see an interesting mix of vegetation there. I think it's going to present a, uh, an attractive viewpoint uh, from my home, and also it'll enhance you know, the value of their home and, and their view, too. Um, I just have a couple of questions. I note on the plan that fir trees at maturity have a spread of 15 to 20 feet and that they're a pyramid in shape. So that would indicate to me that they're about 15 to 20 feet at the base. Uh, and the plan appears to put the plants about four feet from my property line. I'm just wondering if that's going to fit okay. Um, and uh, I'd also just like to be assured that this is going to be planted this spring. Um, and um, I'm still a little bit curious about the, the fence and how that, that comes in. It sounds like it's coming next year. So those, um, those would be the, the questions I would have. Thank you. <clears throat> Maybe we can have Mr. Carroll speak to that after the public uh, session. Or any other members of the public uh, wish to speak? If there being no further interest, we'll close the public part of the, uh, of the hearing. Uh, We'll now have a board discussion on completeness. Mr. Carroll, would you like to respond to the uh, commenter? Sure. I think so. You, you had really two questions. One was um, location of the of the evergreen trees in proximity to the rear uh, property line, and the second is really the integration of the fence. Um, the trees the trees are located on this on this plan here. They're located. You're correct. They're located about five feet or so, four to five feet from the property line. Um, our, our experience is those trees really um, do keep a pretty narrow kind of um, columnar form to them. And, um, you know, I would, I would expect that there may be some kind of over time, there may be some branching that might occur on your side, but um, if in fact the fence does extend all the way across here. You know, um, the plan we, we submitted really showed a fence only going across this open part, uh, but tonight uh, Samana indicated to me that she was considering or, or would be willing to kind of extend that all the way across. If that's the case, we would probably pull those trees back a little bit if in fact the fence is going to be, be there, but that fence would um, pretty much control any lower branches from, from extending onto your, onto your property. So I think that really kind of satisfies both questions. Uh, the, uh, the you do, and you know, I noticed, I noticed that um, you know one of the reasons that we selected these was was going out there. Of course, it was you know everything is kind of dormant right now, so it's really hard to see how shady things are. But you could tell by the by the shrubs and the growth habits on your side that they're really reaching out for light. I mean, they, there, it's a very shady site, and in fact, um, you know, under ideal conditions, we would probably do some select pruning to that to that oak tree to kind of um, remove some of the loosen up and remove some of the branching and, and create a little more light in there. But um, but I think that uh, you know these trees will will provide a pretty strong buffer for you, and that's that's really the intent. Uh, more than try to open it up for, for uh, more sun for your plants. Maybe you need to, maybe you should be adding some more shade tolerant shrubs back there. Okay, good. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, thank you, Mr. Carroll. Um, I think at this point we, well, does the board have any interest in a site walk? But, um, pardon me? Yeah, we're going to, I just was trying to find out if they had an interest in, in a site walk too. Um, the, there being no, is there any further discussion or uh, do I have a motion on completeness? Joe? Make a motion for completeness. 
motion for the board to consider. Be it ordered that based on the plans and materials submitted and the facts presented, the application of Srinivas Rangavarapu for an amendment to the previously approved Blueberry Ridge subdivision to replace a vegetated buffer on a lot located at 10 Blueberry Road be deemed complete. I'll second that. Okay, seconded by Victoria. Any discussion on the seconded motion? All in favor? Opposed? Motion carries unanimously. <coughs> um, would the board like to consider proceeding to approval on this, or, uh, or is, there, is there any uh, interest in putting it off to the next hearing? Okay. Um, we also uh, have a text for the motion for approval. Would somebody care to make that motion? Well, I got a couple of questions. I just, oh, I'm sorry. I just wanted to clarify, make sure it's been very clear because we did get the letter from Ms. Bumstead, and I just want to make sure that we've um, answered her questions. One was um, you did ask about the placement of the trees, and that's been answered. And you did ask, will the planting be this spring? And the answer is yes. Yes. The plantings yes. will occur this spring. Okay. Your next question was, when will the fence be installed? So it's known as phase two, but you were, in your letter, you were specific about when will it occur. When will that occur? When is phase two occur? Phase two will probably be next year. Okay. So it's probably not going to occur this spring. Uh, but it, it'll occur next year, and, and, and part of that is just kind of, you know, a funding issue to kind of come up with the funding to kind of pay for both of these improvements. Okay, and I've also heard it, it's, I know we don't um, do the fencing, but right now you, you might go all the way, you might go halfway. Um, is this just something, I'm not sure, does the board even get into fencing, Maureen? I the applicant is correct that the, board, the, the town doesn't approve fencing unless it's being proposed to meet a buffering requirement. Yeah. <laughs> so my suggestion would be that from this far left property line until you get the three sp existing spruces, that section of fence is actually considered part of the buffering requirement. And then if you didn't want to put any fence after that, it's okay. If you do want to put fence in there, it wouldn't be subject to this approval. But from that, that gap would still be considered part of the buffering. Oh, are you, am I hearing correctly? Um, my right, I don't know which is north, south, east, and west. From my oh, right, I've got the laser pointer. I'm kind right of to help me out. <laughs> okay, so which you're saying the from the property line here yeah. to this point here. Actually, it's going to back up to right there. Right here. Okay. So it's about maybe 20 feet. 20 feet of that fence? That's mandatory as part of this, I, phase well, two? The board can just, I think that the board can require that section of fence as part of the buffering of this lot from the abutting properties. Okay. But that wasn't, that wasn't impacted by the violation, right? Uh, I think if you look at the original plan, there was planting all along the boundary. It does depict yeah, planting. It shows the planting. Right. So yeah. you would be allowing the fence in lieu of that planting, which, given the backyard and the argument, that is reasonable. Right. I, I mean, I think the board has, I mean, just like you usually do with any subdivision, you, you've approved subdivisions recently, usually buffering is a combination of existing vegetation, supplemental plantings, and sometimes there are sections of fence that get added where other things aren't going to work. So, you know, the planning board of 2002 did exactly that for the boundary of the Blueberry Ridge subdivision, where there was existing vegetation. They said, okay, just don't cut the existing vegetation. Maybe you add some plantings in where there's existing vegetation, just to thicken it up. There are places where um, there was just plantings put in, and there were places where there was plantings and a fence. So they, I am saying that, that the board can look at that section from the edge of those, the triple existing evergreens over to the property line and look at a buffering requirement there. 
and you could you could look at asking the applicant to put in more landscape. You could say you've landscaped most of that backyard. I understand your point about wanting a little bit of open space and just putting a fence in there for that amount of space is not a bad idea as well. Or you could say, okay, we really don't think we need a buffer there. But the original plan did have some buffering shown there. The, the, the optional quality of the fence so is kind of messing this up a little bit because Pat was saying earlier, if they decide to do the full fence, they'll actually move the trees back from where they're shown on the plan oh, yeah. toward the house, and that's essentially changing your plans. Yep, that's right. Which, well, it does the, make the, number of, the number of trees and their general location within that buffer zone will not change. I mean, they'll, they'll, they might shift a foot or two, but um, they're still going to be remain within that that no disturb buffer zone that, right. uh, that we had kind of, uh, so we have to that was part of the original subject. We don't require precision on the placement of the trees? Is that there is not? Um, typically, you allow some field location of the trees. So usually movement of a couple of feet is considered reasonable. Um, if you were going to move it 20 feet, then yeah, you can yeah. start at the gap. So now there's not room to move it 20 feet. Okay, so that's not a problem if he wants to. I don't believe if he's just pulling them forward a couple of feet that that's really going to get picked up by anyone. So actually, when you go to plant these trees in the springtime, you'll already know if you're going to want to put a fence there or not. Am I hearing that if you have a fence, you want to pull them back a little? I mean, that's you're not right. going to pull them back the next spring. No, no, no. they're planted. No. So you're going to have an idea of whether or not there'll be a fence in that location. Yes. By springtime. Yes. That would make sense. Well, Victoria, are you proposing then that we do something specific with respect to the fence other than what's shown? Well, I, I, as part of the board, um, as Maureen pointed out, we could say that that phase two, to at least a certain point, is mandatory, or we could suggest plantings. I mean, you know, we could suggest whatever type of buffer. I'm hearing them say fence. I'm okay with fence. I don't know what the rest of the board The thinks. plan already, we already own the fence on that side of the property as part of the, what they're submitting. Um, There's not, it doesn't say optional. It just says yeah. six foot wood stockade fence phase two. So that's part of the plan. And maybe we just need to clarify how long phase two can happen after phase one. But I think um, Pat's point is that the continuation of that fence is really, the, that's up to the owners, of, you know, and however they want to work out the sure. fence with their neighbor adjacent to them. I think they were saying they were going to go up to this point. That's what Maureen was saying. Was right, and the really fence actually required. goes to the first proposed evergreen where they were both agreeing that the fence has to come to at least where there are trees planted right now. But if the applicant is proposing to go all the way to what is, you know, the first proposed tree, I'm fine with that. But I would also like to know when phase two begins or ends, something along those lines. I don't know if anyone else on the board cares to hear that. Well, it seems to me that in the context of what we would vote on tonight to approve it, uh, we simply have the reference to the plans and materials submitted, so it's silent on the timing of phase two, and perhaps we can insert some language in the resolution if we do approve it to pick up that point. Phase two ran to be implemented by sure, within, within two years or three years or something like that. I'm okay with it if the rest of the board is okay with some type yeah, of parameter. Let's uh, try to get this done by discussion and then decide if we want to vote in this. Um, I guess I would propose that we add a condition to the approval saying that the new trees shown on the plan shall be planted within six months of the date of this approval and the fence Shown on, the fence shown on the plan shall be completed within 24 months, or I, I don't know if you need more time than that or not. 
24 to 36 months. I mean, th three years would probably be a maximum. Um, and that is a wall-to-wall -wall fence? No, no, just as no. put on the plan. Just, just as, as indicated plan. here. Just oh, I'm, I'm sorry, that, that does cut it off at the uh, first. Uh, right. Well, we could, we could first tree, right? if you wanted to modify the plan to only require the first one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight posts, assuming the circles mean posts, not exactly, but anyway, you could do that. Because we could, that we could really do that and, make and up submit that numbers. back to, to staff. Well, if the board if if the board approved it with the condition that only, I don't know, I'm 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 kind of it's about forty feet, thirty feet. I think it's it's it's, it's actually more like twenty. If you look at yeah. if you look at the rear yard setback, which is twenty feet, I believe okay. it is. Yeah, I mean, um, that's about the same length that we're going. My for. suggestion, I mean, in in order to meet the buffering standard and require the applicant to do absolutely no more than they have to do, and that leaves options open to the applicant to do other things you know you may want to say that the fence the first 20 feet has to be installed within 24 months and just leave it at that that's fair and then um, if the applicant chooses to add more fencing that's private decision that's I think that's fair okay that works. board member is happy with that approach mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. okay um, would somebody like to make a motion and incorporate that uh, these two conditions that we've just discussed in the form of a motion that we can vote on? Victoria, I didn't you? catch your first. Sorry, I'm, I'm <laughs> sorry. Do you, you have a lane time? You sure. caught the second one, but not the first. <laughs> uh, where is it? Here it is. Findings of fact. Srinivas and Sumana Srungavarapu are requesting an amendment to the previously approved Blueberry Ridge subdivision to replant a vegetated buffer on a lot located at 10 Blueberry Road that was removed in error, which will be reviewed for compliance with section 1625 amendments to previously approved subdivisions. Two, the applicant has prepared a plan to scale depicting existing and proposed vegetation and fencing. Three, the subdivision amendment substantially complies with section 1631 subdivision standards. Therefore, be it ordered that based on the plans and materials submitted and the facts presented, the application of Srinivas Srungavarapu for an amendment to the previously approved Blueberry Ridge subdivision to replace a vegetated buffer on, lot, on a lot located at 10 Blueberry Road be approved subject to the following conditions. One, that all new planting shown on the plan be completed not later than six months after the date of this approval and that the first 20 feet of the fencing shown on the rear lot line be completed within 24 months of the date of this approval. I would second that. 20 feet from the north, south. It's from the west. Mm -hmm. from westerly. The west, westerly corner of the property. Westerly corner, right. Westerly corner of the property. Okay, do we have a second to that motion? I would say. Victoria, uh, is there any discussion on the second in motion? Uh, all in favor? Opposed? Carries unanimously. Great, right, thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Grove. Okay, our, excuse me, the um, next item of business is the um, Excuse me, Brothers Way, Legacy Way, Private Road Amendment. Kristen Murray is requesting an amendment to a previously approved Brothers Way, Private Road. Uh, excuse me, to add a second lot and to change the name to Legacy Way. Uh, the application is submitted for completeness in a public hearing this evening. Uh, the plan will be reviewed under Section 1631 of the Subdivision Ordinance. 
procedure will be as follows. The planner will provide a summary of the project <coughs> in the context of the town regulations. The applicant will present the project. There will be a uh, chance for the public uh, to speak if they wish. Um, the board uh, will then make a finding on the subject of completeness. If it's considered incomplete, the uh, reasons for that will be specified. If it's complete, the substantive uh, review may begin. <coughs> if, if that is the case, then there will also be a, a chance for the public to speak on the application itself, on its merits, and the board will then discuss and reach a decision on the application. Um, momentarily, the planner will do the summary. This is another uh, project that's been uh, received multiple approvals from the board. Uh, the most recent, this is uh, Brothers Way, which the applicants are proposing to rename Legacy Way, was approved by the planning board as a private road. So this has never received a per se subdivision approval, but the private road approval comes out of the subdivision ordinance. So the applicant is not proposing to make any changes to uh, the roadway at all. What they are proposing to do is um, to, now that they own all of the land, is to create a second lot that will also have frontage on the new Legacy Way. Uh, also a small portion of property is going to be conveyed out of this area to an abutting property owner, which is the same property owner. Uh, the main issue that uh, came up was a proposal by the applicant to serve the new lot with a well. Uh, for drinking water and Legacy Way has an approved water line in the road um, so staff has strongly urged the applicant to consider serving the new lot with public water and they have uh, agreed to make that change to the plan so with that I'm gonna turn it over. Thank you Marie. Uh, the applicant's representative John Mitchell will give us a presentation on the project. Good. Good evening, uh, John Mitchell, Mitchell Associates, representing uh, Christine Murray uh, for this uh, um, proposed amended plan of a previously approved uh, private road application. Um, the plan on the screen is the previously approved plan uh, that was approved in 2006 as a private road application. I'm sorry, it was approved in 2004. Um, in 2006, the former applicant, Steve Murray, uh, did some preliminary uh, work on the proposed roadway, uh, basically consisting of um, final grading and the installation of the gravel base uh, to the roadway. Um, in two in June of 2014, uh, Chris Murray purchased uh, the entire property from Steve Murray. So we're before you this evening with uh, an amendment uh, which includes basically there are two items. Number one is to, um, I'm going to go to the second plan, is to uh, change the name of the road from Brothers Way to Legacy Way. That's the uh, first amendment request. And the second amendment request is to reconfigure some of the property lines, uh, basically to uh, establish a third lot. Uh, there are actually three lots that have been established. Uh, the third lot, which is parcel C, located here, is proposed to be transferred to the Abata, which is Chris Murray. Um, so parcel A is this lot. Um, uh, and the amendment to that, to parcel A, is to establish that line and that line. Uh, 
Um, other than that, it's identical to what it was previously. Parcel B is this lot, which um, continues down into this, the novelty portion of the property. And the amendment to that is, uh, consists of creating or, or including all of the land east of the legacy way. Um, and then, as I mentioned, it continues down into this area here uh, to get the minimum 80,000 square foot lot size. And then parcel C will be transferred to Chris Murray. Uh, the applicant uh, intends to complete uh, the final road improvements uh, by the end of this year. <clears throat> um, we, we did receive comments from staff, uh, which have all been addressed in a letter uh, dated February 17th, um, and I believe you have in your, it was sent to you um, last week. And I'm just going to quickly go over those comments. Uh, the first, which uh, Maureen uh, highlighted, is to, we changed, we took off the, uh, the proposed well, which we had in this location for Parcel B, and we finally got a letter from the Portland Water District. It was, it literally took weeks to, to get a letter from them um, indicating um, their requirements. Essentially, we will be, uh, we'll be able to tap onto the main at this point here. Actually, there's a stub that exists um, and run a new water service down Legacy Way to, uh, to Parcel D with public water. And we have put a note on the plan to that effect that Parcel B will be required to connect to the, uh, to the public water. The second comment had to do with uh, proposed building envelopes, and it was uh, Parcel A, the building envelope hasn't changed at all. Parcel B has enlarged, uh, Parcel B building envelope has enlarged to include uh, most of this area here. Um, so that, that has been clarified on this amended plan, and as well as being labeled. The third item had to do with buffer plantings and uh, attached to our February 17th letter is an exhibit, an eight and a half by 11 exhibit that shows uh, all of the existing vegetation that, uh, that is along the easterly property line as well as, uh, or as well as plantings that have been installed by Skip and Chris over the past two years. Uh, those plantings um, total, uh, total 18 uh, different plants. There are six uh, three-inch caliber maple trees that border the uh, Legacy Way. Uh, there are evergreen trees um, as well as other uh, beech and magnolia and birch trees that have been planted by the applicant. And then the fourth comment uh, has to do with the maintenance agreement. Um, and we have, we have stated that the applicant will provide the signed maintenance agreement and submit it to the town upon ownership of the transfer of lot uh, A or B. So I think uh, with that, um, I'll turn it over to the board. <clears throat> Thank you, um, We are on the topic of completeness. Do board members have any questions for John uh, that would clarify completeness before we open it up to the public? I guess I have one question. If you talk about wetlands, is it that permissible to add into the 80,000 square? You, but you can't build on it, but on the other hand, you can add it to, to the side. Correct. Okay, thank you. Okay, at this point, we'll open the meeting to the public for any comments on the subject of completeness. Well, there being no uh, takers on that, <coughs> excuse me, 
uh, close the public hearing. And does the board want to talk about completeness uh, in any respect prior to a motion? Okay, we'll entertain a motion on completeness. Make a motion on completeness. Be it ordered that based on the plans and materials submitted and the facts presented, the application of Christine Murray for an amendment to the previously approved Brothers Way private road located off Fowler Road to add a second lot and also change the name to Legacy Way be deemed complete. <coughs> Excuse me, is there a second? Second by Joe. Uh, any discussion on the second in motion? All in favor? Opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Uh, we will now consider the motion for approval. Is there any. Uh, okay. Right. Before the board, I guess we have. Uh, we will reopen the matter to the public to uh, make any comments on the application itself. There being no members of the public who wish to speak, we'll close the public portion of the hearing. Um, <coughs> on the merits of the application, is there any discussion that the, the board would like to have? Questions for Mr. Mitchell? I Great. do have one question. Um, as I was going through our um, conditions of approval, there was one that said, um, Plan shall be revised that shall that parcel B will serve by public water with information on how that connection will be constructed. I'm not sure, do we need, now that we know parcel A will be connected to public water, do we need also to show information on how that connection will be constructed? I, I don't know the level of detail that. On, might on parcel A you're referring to? Yeah, there, there is, a, uh, there is a, a water line, a water service shown extending from Grover Road all the way down to Paso so that, that That's how that will be connected. Okay. It's, I on, know it's on the plan. Yeah, in the town engineer. Wanted. In this in this situation, the, the note that has been added to the plan by the applicant specifies that the connection has to be done according to town standards. Okay. Thank you. From Grover or Fowl? From the, the note says it has to be done to town standards. It doesn't specify where the connection is made. It just says has to be public water, has to be done to town standard. There's, there's, the reality is that there are, there are a couple options for the applicant right now on how they make that water connection. And there didn't seem to be a compelling need to decide now which option they used as long as they connect it to public water in the end. However, the, the note on the plan is either follow or Grover. Well, and there's also, you know, if it's one line for two lots, two separate lines in the right of way. I mean, there's some options right. out there, and it just seemed that the, the compelling public interest was that it be connected to public water and it be done, the, the physical construction be done in a manner that's consistent with town standards. Right. Okay. Carolyn? Now, am I correct? What you two are talking about as far as the note being on the plan, it's not on the plan that we received in our packet, am I correct? It is, a, no, it is not on the plan that you received because that it was It has submitted. since been negotiated and it's appeared on. It was on the most, that plan that you got in the email. It's gonna be up here. In this, in this guy? Yes. Yeah, and you, you probably wanna leave that as a condition so that you know we can check that out, but I've, worked closely with the applicant's representative on getting a note on there that I thought met our needs while preserving a little bit of flexibility for the applicant. So it was kind of like a plan. Yeah, you're not going to find it on your plan. <laughs> Can you point out again where the building envelopes are? Building envelope for parcel A is right here, this rectangular shape. Right. And then parcel B consists of most of this Okay. Area. So I think we want our condition to be that there be one label building envelope for each of parcel A and parcel B. It's not a single contiguous building space. No. Okay. Okay. 
Any further discussion, questions for Mr. Mitchell before we uh, talk about approval? Okay. Um, Elaine, do you say where, where the point you made was speaking to on the findings of the on, findings? On uh, condition number two, the plans be revised to show one label oh. building envelope for each of for, parcel A yeah. and parcel B. Right, okay. Um, do we have a motion for approval? Well, uh, can I? <laughs> motion for approval, findings of fact. Christine Murray is requesting an amendment to previously approved Brothers Way Private Road approval to add a second lot and also change the name to Legacy Way, which requires re review under section 19-7-9 of the zoning ordinance and section 16-3-1 of the subdivision ordinance. The water supply for partial B needs identification. Clarification, is that no longer, is that? Yeah, yeah okay. because we're still gonna have that condition. The building envelopes for partial A and partial B should be clearly labeled. The applicant has subsequently addressed the standards of the subdivision ordinance section 16-3-1. Therefore, be it ordered that based on the plans and materials submitted and the facts presented, the application of Christine Murray for an amendment to the previously approved Brothers Way Private Road located off Fowler Road to add a second lot and also change the name to Legacy Way be approved subject to the following conditions. That the plans be revised to show parcel B will be serviced by public water with information on how that connection will be constructed. That the plans be revised to show one labeled building envelope for each of parcel A and parcel B. Parcel B. The road maintenance agreement and access agreement for parcel B be submitted in a form acceptable to the town attorney and the town manager and signed by the applicant. And that the plans be revised and submitted to the town planner for review and approval prior to recording the subdivision file. Do we have a second in the motion? Second. <coughs> Excuse me, thank you. The, um, we, motion has been made and seconded. Is there any discussion? All in favor? Opposed? Carries unanimously. Thank you. Thank you. Next order of business. Uh, has to do with the land use amendments. <coughs> At the February 11, 2013 meeting, the town council referred recommendations of the future open space preservation committee and the last package of comprehensive plan recommendations to refer to as land use package to the planning board for implementation. This, <coughs> this is being now considered. Um, based on the uh, present state of the drafting is, is, present, is contained in the February 23 memo from the town planner to the board. Um, I think what we said we would do is have Maureen review uh, briefly where we are on this draft and uh, there will be a chance for public comment, which does not appear like it will happen and then a substantive board review on what we have before us. So um, you've seen this for a while, um, and I will try to be brief <coughs> in a summary, but this is the last of the five packages of amendments that were originally assembled to implement the comprehensive plan. This package of amendments also includes recommendations from the Future Open Space Preservation Committee for lack of a better name, we call this package the land use amendments because most of these recommendations come from the land use chapter of the comprehensive plan. Uh, the planning board is well aware that 
the reasons that you are processing these amendments is one, that they are recommended by the comprehensive plan. The comprehensive plan was created using an extensive public process. It was a committee of town residents who met over 21 months. It was adopted by the council. It's been deemed consistent by the state with state goals. And you need to have a comprehensive plan in order to legally administer land use regulations. So without a comprehensive plan, you can't have zoning, you can't have subdivision. And the zoning and subdivision and other land use regulations you have need to be consistent with your comprehensive plan. That doesn't mean it needs to be in lockstep, but it, they, shouldn't be, they shouldn't be grinding against each other. So this, these, this package of amendments implements a comprehensive plan, a set of comprehensive plan recommendations. It also embodies a recognition that the town's demographics are changing. It also advances the town's long-standing policy goals to preserve open space, to preserve agricultural lands, and to protect sensitive environmental areas. Uh, the package of amendments includes a cover memo prepared by me which lists each recommendation and a description of the change that's being proposed to either the zoning ordinance, the subdivision ordinance, or the map of the sewer ordinance. Uh, we have 29 pages of amendments here. It includes two maps, one to the sewer service area map, and one the transfer of developments map. Uh, I just wanted to highlight that these recommendations, first and foremost, preserve and enhance the clustering provisions that allow new development to occur while at the same time preserving large chunks, and by large chunks I mean at least 40 percent of the gross area of a development parcel. Uh, these recommendations do promote new development connections to the public sewer as opposed to on-site septic subsurface disposal. For the first time in a long time, these recommendations include uh, a reformulation of multiplex development. And the board spent a lot of time on this the last couple of months. The most uh, current change, which you haven't seen until tonight, was uh, based on the discussions you had at the last workshop. And following those, that discussion, the changes that I made now have taken the new architectural design standards that have been drafted are now, now would apply not just to multiplex development that happens to be cluster development, but it would apply to all multiplex development. Uh, and what it's doing is we're taking out the very brief standards that you have right now that limit the number of units in a building and instead imposing a whole host of regulations that look at architectural character and the bulk of a building, the size of a building, the exterior materials. In addition, there is a new section that provides incentives for multiplex development to advance public goals. <coughs> so for example, if a multiplex development is going to save more than 45 percent of its land area as open space, if it's going to preserve agricultural land, if it's going to connect to the sewer, if it's going to have more housing diversity, then there's an opportunity for a density bonus. There is a cap on uh, how much bonus you can have. It's no more than 30 percent. Um, and there are some other provisions that you're all familiar with. There is a minimum lot size for multifamily that has been decreased so that it's more comparable to lot size minimums for subdivision or new subdivision lot development. Uh, and I'm going to step aside from the multiplex, but that is probably one of the biggest pieces of changes in here. Um, the board did go through a significant effort, met with large lot owners as part of the realignment of the transfer of development rights map. Uh, I've said it before, I don't think transfer of development rights is going to be used much at all, but the map proposal realigns the proposed land that we would like to see preserved with the open space priorities that the FOSS committee came up with, and that's creating um, highest priority preservation for agricultural land, for greenbelt properties, and for wildlife habitat. And then there are two little tag-along amendments that have been included in this package because um, they seem consistent with what we're working on and they're cleanup provisions. 
One of them is we have added a few provisions into the zoning ordinance that uh, clarify the references to things like public hearings and public notices and performance guarantees from when you amended the subdivision ordinance two years ago. The final item in here is a request from the code officer for a cleanup amendment to clarify the frontage requirement for non-conforming lots. And the proposal is to make clear in the ordinance what the practice has been for over 20 years. So uh, that's what you have in front of you for a package of amendments. Uh, going forward, it, the board has made a commitment to try to get this done by the end of March so that it can be referred to the council. In order to stick with that deadline, what you would need to do this evening would be to table this to the March meeting when a public hearing could be held. Uh, when you table something to a public hearing, you should be t what you're sending out to the public should really be at the 95% level of what you plan to adopt. But there's nothing that says that after a public hearing, you can't make some tweaks to the proposal. If you are going to completely reverse it, then you really need to start over and hold another public hearing. I say that because the only thing that, in my opinion, that it still needs a little bit of tweaking in here is that we still have the pictures for the architectural design standards and we still want to convert those to line drawings. That's not done yet. I'm hoping to have that done by the March meeting. Um, but that would be the only thing that might adjust and I don't consider that a substantive change. The line drawings will be along the model of what's in the town center? Yes. It, what the intent, and I'm, I'm talking with two different sets of people on this, would be to take, generally take the pictures that we have in there and convert them to line drawings. So it's just a better presentation of, of what we already have Which shown we, we here. We already have in the ordinance on the other districts. We do. Okay. It's just it would look a little, I mean, what we would propose would look a little different than right. what we have in the, in the business districts. The, the schedule, and we, we can talk about the schedule first or later, but the idea is we, we have an opportunity to talk about this tonight. We have a workshop on March 3rd, 3rd <clears throat> which this could also be scheduled for further talk if we want. And then lastly, there's talk of moving the March public hearing from its scheduled date, um, which has some problems it would have been March seventeenth. Uh, yes. Right. Moving it to the following week, which I guess would be March twenty-fourth. Members can be thinking about that as a twenty-third. I'm sorry, twenty. Though that'd be Monday the Monday the twenty-third. Another Monday night meeting. Yes. Yep. Okay. Monday the twenty-third. Um, but for the sake of what we do this evening, um, I think probably the best bet would be to have Maureen lead us through the least and more complicated things that we haven't yet discussed and try to wrestle with them because a lot of the stuff in this package has been pretty well beaten to that yeah. uh, density being one of the yes one of the big items yeah and let people uh, discuss those and, and uh, see how we stand does anybody have any desires or questions that they want to Raise at the outset. Could you lead us through the public density thing, Maureen? Sure. I, I will, what I will do is, because there's very little here that you haven't already seen. So what I've done, starting on page 5, uh, which is the Residence A district, you'll see two-thirds of the way down, it says I have multiplex housing, minimum five acres, and then um, we had talked about changing setbacks for multiplex, so it was the same as everything else. So on page six, you see we're at the bottom of page six, it says multiplex housing and elder care facilities. I've just eliminated multiplex housing from that line, which means that the setbacks that would normally apply to any other use would now apply to multiplex housing. And I've done the same thing in the RB and the RC districts. Uh, the other thing I've done is on page 7, in sort of the middle, middle of the page, you'll see it says multiplex site plan review, multiplex housing and elder care facilities are required. 
and what I've said, it is part of the site plan review. I've referenced the brand new standards that um, have been drafted that now reside in the open space zoning provisions. So what this says is any multiplex housing development in Cape Elizabeth would get site plan review and would have to comply with these new multiplex housing standards that are predominantly those architectural design standards. Is that clear? Okay. So I'm going to think of that happening in the RB, same way, happening in the RC, the same way. Um, and then to go towards the density, that should look fairly close to um, what you saw at the last workshop. Um, starting page up to page 22 is probably the best place to go. And this is the public benefit density bonus section. So this is only if you, you want to go over and above. Um, otherwise, there's no change in density for multiplex. It's the same density as you're allowed right now. But this is the section where you're allowed to increase your density by up to 30% only if you are, go, are advancing other public benefit goals. So I've added in here, starting on line 21, um, your proposal that a one bedroom unit would only count as half a unit of density, that a two bedroom unit would count as 0.66 units of density, and that only a three bedroom unit would be considered the one unit density. Uh, we still have the maximum building footprint, the maximum uh, height limit that are the same as when you talked about this at the workshop. The side yard setback and the rear yard setback are the same as when you discussed this at the workshop. And then the agricultural land bonus is the same as what you discussed at the workshop, which is that for every 30,000 square feet of agricultural land preserved, a density bonus of one unit would be provided. Um, open space, uh, that's been slightly adjusted since the workshop. Right now, um, open space for any development in the RB district would be increased from 40 to 45 percent. If you're a multiplex development and you provide more than 45 percent gross acreage as open space, then um, you can get a density bonus. And in this case, for every 40,000 square feet of additional open space, you would get one, um, one additional unit. And keep in mind that in the RA district, you need 66,000 square feet, 60,000 square feet of land area in order for, to get a, a development, a multiplex unit. So this is an incentive at 40,000 to preserve open space because for, for two thirds of what you normally would need for a dwelling unit, you can get a dwelling unit if you preserve the open space. So there's a built in incentive here. And then um, affordable housing is also something that we already allow a density bonus if you provide more affordable housing than you're required to. And that is something that is referred to in this section as well. Okay. The concept here is this would be like a menu and um, a property owner or a developer, if they're interested in using these bonuses, would assemble them as they see fit. Okay, I have a stupid question. I hate to ask a stupid question. The um, whole dimensional standards, A, under public benefit mm -hmm. bonus. Mm -hmm. Did I misunderstand? I thought those were the dimensional standards for multiplex and not only if you got a density bonus. The, the dimensional standards for multiplex are in the, um, in the RA, the RB, and the RC district. So for example, if we look at the public benefit density bonuses on page 22, um, First of all, you don't have the opportunity for counting one and two bedroom units as less than one unit. You would have to count every single unit as one unit. Under maximum building footprint of, of 10,000 square feet, the maximum building footprint for multiplex housing would be 7,500 square feet. 
and the maximum building height would be 35 feet. Only under this provision can you go up to 50 feet. And then the side yard setback would be the same side yard setback for any structure because a single family home can be 35 feet high and the setback is either 20 or 30 feet depending on which district you're in. And then only if you're doing these density bonuses can you go up to 50 feet and if you go up to 50 feet you need to have a build, you need to have a setback that's 35 feet plus 10 feet. You have to have the building height plus 10 feet. Okay. So it's a variable setback. So what we've done is we've actually uh, removed some of the dimensional standards and used the RA district. Um, does that answer your question? Yes. Okay. But your thinking always has to start with the basic requirements of the district in which you're planning to Yes. Build. And you go to the multiplex standards in that district, be it A, B, C, right. or whatever. You, you, and you know, most of the land that's still available for development is in the RA district, but you can go to the RB and the RC. There's still some lots there as well. And you, you start with that RA district. You look what's required. You would need five acres in the RA district to consider a multiplex development. You would need to look at um, the setbacks that are in the RA district. But at the very end of the RA district, it says site plan is review is required for this type of development and you need to go to this section for um, other design standards. So this section starting on page 18, the multiplex housing standards, that's the section that every multiplex development has to comply with. They have to have 45% open space. Their building size is now limited to a footprint not to exceed 7,500 square feet and a height limit not to exceed 35 feet, which is the same height limit we have for everyone. They must be connected to public water and public sewer. There is a built-in bonus if the sewer is, a far, is, is far away. Um, and then it has standards that say how you preserve your open space. Um, the building location has to have a certain uh, orientation to the street if it's within 100 feet of the street. There has to be uh, good landscaping between the building and the street. And this, this is what I call good landscaping, is in addition to the buffering and landscaping requirements that are in the site plan regulations. So these are very tailored to multiplex development and they layer or expand upon what's already in site plan regulations. Uh, parking, it talks about parking areas and how they need to be designed, but you start with section 1978, which is the off-street parking section, and remember, there are parking requirements in site plan review. So this is just kind of like the third layer of making sure parking is designed well for multiplex. Then under page, on page 20, we have a whole new section, which honestly, we don't have this in the ordinance at all right now. There is nothing in the ordinance that talks about what a multiplex building has to look like. And this is the new, this is really the new piece. So you could come in today and propose a multiplex building. For example, Eastman Meadows. Um, there was no requirement on, on what those buildings had to look like. Now you have a, a requirement that talks about massing, that talks about the roof line, that talks about entrances and windows, and that talks about exterior materials. And you can stop there. Yes, sir. There's one simple thing. I mean, I understand it's about the design. When I first joined the board, one of the things I found out was that nobody ever did perk tests because there was no requirement. So now if you're going to go to this type of thing and have something standing a little bit taller than 35 feet, wouldn't a perk test or some sort of underwater, uh, underground water or whatever it is that might cause the building to change be, be mandatory rather than possibly if the builder wanted to mm -hmm. do it? No, I don't know if it's covered, well, if, if this is outside the scope of I that. mean, you're asking about structural integrity of a building. Pretty much. Well, we and, got, yeah. And those are things we rely on the building code to handle that. Usually, that's not within the purview of the planning board. Right, I understand that. But so, it is as far as wetland is concerned. Well, so, but but we don't we 
don't allow a lot of development on wetland one. Right, so that's right. and in the places where let's say the board I mean typically you allow some wetland filled for driveways and access roads. I'm trying to remember I don't I can't remember the last time you've allowed a wetland fill where you've allowed a building to be placed no, on it. But what I mean is the wetland goes along, possibly goes under, and of course now if you did a perk tax, you'd run into that, that, that ground, a wet, because it seeks its own level. I would say that if you're concerned that the ground is not stable to support the structure, that's going to be dealt with as part of the building code. Well, let me put it another way then. If you build a multiplex nowadays, mm -hmm. you might want to put the parking under the building. Mm -hmm. If you do that, mm -hmm. you're going to go down some depths. Mm -hmm. You might run into some dampness coming, rising damp because mm -hmm. you've gone down too low. Mm -hmm. Now, I understand that a uh, that a, a, a builder with, or a developer with some sort of conscience would, would look to see that that's not going to happen. But we don't see, is there anything in Cape Elizabeth that, that requires that to be done? Building code. Requires a perk tax. No, I'm saying those issues are dealt with under the building code. That's the... It's that, not something the board typically deals with. Okay. But is... Whatever I'm going to stick with covered. that answer. If it's covered, then all right. <laughs> Maureen, can you remind me, um, I know we always express building height in terms of feet and not building stories, but 35 right. feet corresponds with how many stories, and then the bonus up to maximum 50 corresponds with how many stories? It's about five. So it's about, it's, it's, for 50 it's, feet, it's roughly, about five yeah, it's roughly five stories, but you know, there aren't that many completely flat sites anymore. I mean, and, and the way we actually have a building height definition that is a little complicated because we have stripped out any opportunity to benefit from filling a property. So most properties have some slope and what we require is them to get the points all the way around of original grade and then they average it to get the height. And the reason I'm saying this is because there's some variability in number of stories. But just on a standard flat lot, a 35-foot limit would mean essentially a building of three stories, and a 50-foot limit would essentially allow the potential of going up to five stories. Right. But I'm sure you, you and I could sit here and we could think of homes that we know of that have um, building, have living space in the attic and have daylight basements. So you might argue that that home has got four or even five stories, or four and a half, or three and a half. So w what we usually do is we measure the actual height. But yes, I would say it's roughly 10 feet per story. Thank you. Marie, can you, just so I, the flow of the logic in this thing, if I'm a developer and I want to do a multiplex yep. in residential A, I can first go to the residential A requirements and I can say, okay, I'm going to meet those and that's how I'll do my property. Right. But then I, I might say, gee, I'd like to get a little bit more done here, so I'm going to go to the open space zoning. You don't really have an option on going to the open space zoning. In A, it is. You, you, you don't, because yes, I, I put in that little, that little tag and that was the thing I wanted to call attention to because I did it based on what I heard at the last workshop, and that's the, if you um, start on page five, that's the Residence A district, and this does it in every district. You look at the permitted uses, and you can find multiplex <coughs> housing listed as a permitted use. Yeah. There's setbacks, and it's in there. And then on page seven, in the middle of page seven, you see the Residence B district. Oh. Just above that, F on line 10, is site plan review. And if you look at, the, you've only got one, item one here, but F is the same section in each district. And it says, these are the things that have to get site plan review. And what I've done here is multiplex housing currently is required to get site plan review. And I've added into this ordinance that is part of site plan review, the standards of section 1972E, multiplex housing standards shall also apply. So it forces you into the open space zoning provisions. And once you're in that section, 1972E, 
which is the section right before the bonus. Page 18, right. That's right. So 1972E is page 18. Look, okay, and it starts right off by saying <coughs> you got to do this do stuff. So and then you work your way through those, and by the time you're done, you stop with, I mean, you get through the architectural standards, and then the very next section is public benefit density bonus. You so can boost it up. You can boost it up. Boost but it the, up. So the, but that first the, the open space is optional in, in A and C for single family. For, Correct. Or for, for subdivision. Yes. But not for multiplex. Multiplex, you've got to, you've got to hit the. And that's, place. and I did that. That is the new thing that right. you haven't seen since the last workshop. I, had, I, I, I you, that I you morning. made me feel optimistic. You seemed fairly okay with the multiplex housing standards, and so I said, okay, let's just, let's just make it a mandatory requirement for all multiplex development. Which is what I thought I heard at the workshop, but. You know, I could have got that wrong. Multiplex cluster. I mean, they're both open space right. types of development. So. Yeah, and I mean, that's a policy decision that we want any multiplex development to, to give us the open space preservation that the town seems to want. Right, Peter. I see Victoria struggling to hear you. Victoria, I'm sorry. <laughs> no, that's okay. Yeah, I, I am. I, I'm, it's hard to hear. I haven't learned the requirements of the job. Yes. Okay. Uh, Sorry if this is redundant. I'm just really trying to make sure that I understand this. Is um, back on page 22 when we talk about unit density of the 0.5, you know, two bedroom is 0.66. I thought when I was proposing that that it would not be part of if you do an agricultural land or open space or affordable housing, then you get that. I thought I was proposing that and. You know, for any multiplex, and if you want to do that, I can do that. But now I, I have to. I'll move. I can logistically. It, it can be done. I will just move it to a different section of I, the proposal. Thank you, Victoria, because that's what confused me is that piece I thought applied to all multiplex. That's what I wanted, but I have to run this back to the board because when I do look at agricultural land, it does say you will get a bonus of one unit if you do. I look at open space and it says you would get a density bonus of one unit per 40, you know, there is the opportunity to still have incentives because I great, you know, I, I believe in um, promoting, preserving agricultural land, the open space and the affordable housing. So I still like the fact that um, most of them have density bonuses built in there, but I actually personally would like to see all multiplex housing not just those tied to those other three issues, use that unit density. So I'm throwing it out to the rest of the board if yes. they want to see it moved or not. I agree with you. Okay. That's two. <laughs> the rest are thinking about I'm saying I'm not this. sure I followed your point, I'm sorry. We, we have a, one of the little metrics has to do with the number of veterans. Mm -hmm. And you want us, you're saying that it, now only applies in certain cases, not across the board? No, I think that's backwards. She, she's right now that the way to calculate density based on bedroom is only in the public benefit density bonus section. And what she would like is for it to be the automatic way that all density is calculated for multifamily units, multiplex. That's what and I'm proposing. And the way to do that would be to take I mean, I can tell you, with a little bit of language change, to take lines 21, 22, and 23 on page 22, take it out of that section, and add it on, on page 13 at line 17. And it would be, for the purposes of calculating density for multiplex development, the following shall apply. So it's not that, logistically, it's not that hard to do. If I move it to this multiplex section, um, then that's the way that units would be calculated. For the multiplex. So if you were to build, say, like eight two-bedroom row houses, those would, each row house would count as 0.66 units and not fully 
even though you're not applying for any of the density bonuses. Correct. I see it as a way to encourage um, other housing choices. Um, I don't want it to be strictly market driven that somebody would say, I can get the most money if I put in a three bedroom. For, I'm thinking, um, for example, seniors or our students, people that have lived in this community a long time and want to remain in this community but have different housing choices, a three bedroom may not be affordable for them or, or a housing choice for them. They may not just need three bedroom. So I, I'm looking more to say, well, what could we do so that developers would build something that would give a diversified housing choice right down to the number of bedrooms, let alone that you wouldn't act, you know, it might be a condo or some, an apartment or something. That was the purpose behind wanting it to be moved up front and not tied to, well, you only get that choice. Otherwise, the market's going to drive it. If you choose not to go with agricultural land, you may not have any of the open space or the affordable. So that's if, where that came from. But unless you go up, doesn't make sense because you're using a plan which is expensive and now you're trying to get a, sorry you're, you, you're using a plan which is expensive you can't go up to make use of additional amounts so now, now you've got somebody who wants a one bedroom or a two bedroom and so you're using up a lot of space that you've paid for. It's to do with the cost of the land that your problem is. Not the type of housing that it is, but if you go up, then you get better value on the cost of your land. So you'd be able to create one or two bedroom apartments. Whereas I don't see in a two-story thing that you could, you could get it to be efficient in terms of the cost of building and the profit margin. Mm -hmm. That's my view anyway. I, I don't know if you see it that way. Um, bottom line is I'll still throw it out there that I would like to see that moved as Maureen described it other than keep it the way it is. And so I'm looking for other support from the board. Maureen, I have a, a density problem in my head, I guess, because I thought of if the multiplex had to be under the um, open space provisions, yep. the open space provisions say you have to have at least 45% of the gross acreage open space. Yes. And one of the three, A, B, and C, B, C is open space. Right. If more than 45% then yada yada. Right. Then can't you, doesn't that bring this in for any multiplex because it has to be within the open space. Um, no, it doesn't. Agenda. It doesn't because you. Uh, I, I thought this applied to all. It doesn't. The way it's drafted right now, it does not. Okay. The the way this way of calculating units has a benefit, and it's 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 located under the public benefit density bonus section. Okay. So what? the only way that you can use it is if you are if if you're providing this public, if you're participating in these public benefits that we're talking about. But one of the benefits that you have to meet is the open space benefit. Right, you have to have more multiplex. than 45%. Right. And you you have, have to set aside 45%. If all, it's only if you're set aside, setting aside more than 45% then that you fall under the public benefit density bonus section. 40, 46%. 46%, then you're in this section. Uh, okay, okay if, well, I'm sorry, one last little question and then sure, i start doing my job. The, uh, if you don't need a public benefit, right. what is the density? Or, the density would be what's on page 13. With? Which is the same density we have now. With no uh, open space? No, you still, you have to have the, if, if you do not go into the public benefit density bonus section, let's pretend that we don't have that section at all, and you want to build a multiplex. Well, the first thing is you go to the RA district, you find that you need, the new standard is five acres. So you have, you know, let's say you have a seven acre lot. Okay, you want to build a multiplex development. 
um, you are limited to buildings with a height of 35 feet mm -hmm. and they have to be set back 30 feet from the property line and at the very end of the RA district it says by the way you need site plan review and you need to go to section 1972E which is on page 18. But you're still stuck at one unit per 66,000 square feet. Yes. Unless you get into the public benefit. Yes. Uh. Um, Henry. Yeah, I have a question of our architect and our planner here. If you go up above 35 feet, what do you build with? You can't build with wood, can you, or can you? Yes, you can build with wood. So you how can go four, sto uh, four stories, and the top stories can have a lock. So, so, so it I can guess appear as a five-story building, but with a 50-foot uh, cap and a, our requirement for sloped roof, it's going to be four stories plus a story in the dormer. And that the, what I'm saying, what I'm quoting is just straight wood frame. You can also, there are other types of construction. You could conceivably go five stories. Oh, so, okay, so we've been... It's not likely, because the cost is going to be pretty high, but... If what? If, the, if you try to go more than four stories. Okay, all right, I see what you mean. But I wouldn't say it's never going to happen. Yeah, because I was, was thinking that if you have to go to another material other than wood, the cost is prohibitive and you... Get not if you're back. building Catch on the ocean. Minutes. Sorry? You're not if you're building something valuable on the ocean. I, yes, I have to, I have to agree with that. <laughs> Lee. Um, I would like to say that I, I would agree with um, Victoria's suggestion about moving this to the other part. And I also have a couple of just small drafting suggestions that I think might help to clarify some of the confusion of this section on page 22. It talks about public benefit density bonus, but in fact, open space zoning is a very significant public benefit in Cape Elizabeth. And I think in order to do any multiplex housing in Cape Elizabeth, we already are getting some significant public benefits. We get significant public benefits for, from cluster development. So I think it might be actually helpful if we retitled this section something like additional public benefit <laughs> density bonus or priority public benefit density bonus just to emphasize that this isn't the only place where there's a significant public benefit to this multiplex housing. And I think we would put that both in the title and also in the first sentence, in order to create an incentive for property owners to incorporate additional community goals. Because this is really on top of what's already built in. And the other thing that I think is kind of confusing is... Could, could I interrupt you? I yeah. have no problem in the second one. Would you be willing to let me not put additional in the title? Because then they're going to say, well, where's the first density bonus? <coughs> yeah. Yeah, increased, it, it, it's just, increased. it's trying to make it increased. clear that, or, or increased yep. public benefit, something like that. It becomes density bonus for additional public benefit. Something like that, yeah. Because I think that helps to clarify why we're in this section when there's similar provisions in another section and what jumps you from sub section to section. I like what Carol said. Yep. Okay. The other thing is, I think the structure of the paragraph here, where A, B, and C are all structured the same way, is kind of confusing too. Mm -hmm. And I would suggest that we say um, in the second sentence, when any combination of the following density bonuses, um, in paragraphs B and C, B, C, and D are included in a development. The dimensional standards in paragraph A shall apply. So I that makes a lot of sense. And I can even say in paragraph B, and then I can make it B be the density bonuses, and then it can be I, agricultural land, I, I. Open yeah, day. something like that. Just number the paragraph differently to clarify yep, yep, how it yep. works. Very mm -hmm. good. That was it. Okay, excellent. 
So there's three. <laughs> Four. <laughs> Thank, Thank you, Henry. You. <laughs> okay, so I will be, um, if, if the board decides to forward this to a public hearing in March, I would suggest, suggest you say that as amended to, and this would be, the, amend, the amendments would be the text changes recommended by Mrs. Fallander, Ms. Fallander, and also moving the unit density uh, to a to page 18. Let's just leave it at that. Page 13. 13. Um, 18. 18. Okay, I promise I'll make it work. Well, actually, no, you're right. It's, I wanted it. Um, you want it back in the chart, right? I want it, I want it following the chart. Oh, okay. So, so yeah. the units are still the same. It's just how you calculate the units. So it would be page 13 starting on line 17. So wait, on page 13, then, it would be one one bedroom unit for 33,000 square feet? No, I would leave the chart the same way, and then I would have a paragraph oh, following that it. says, for the purposes of calculating multiplex density, a one bedroom unit shall be considered 0.1 half of the unit of density, a two bedroom unit shall be considered 0.66 units right, of density. Right, but the count so would come out is at one bedroom for 33,000 two bedroom for 44,000. You would, yeah. But I'm not going to represent it okay. that way. Then Maureen, the right. uh, what's left in uh, page 23 on open space is still valid. So you, you essentially yes. are coming at um, yes. density there. It's just the, the way you calculate it is back in page 13. Right. Okay. What, and, and we're going to break up the um, density bonus for public additional public benefits section six into a much more logical organization which would be paragraph a dimensional standards and paragraph paragraph b would be bonuses and there'll be a subset sub paragraphs for agricultural open space and portable housing sounds good i know this might sound to be a funny stupid a stupid, a stupid question. But we have a hotel on the expensive section of beach, which we were just talking about. Um, what's the density of, what's the height of a hotel and the well, number of rooms? hotel is not a permitted use in the RA. The no, I mean, but we have it, we have a section in. Uh, a hotel is a permitted use in the BB district. Right. And the maximum height is 35 feet. That's it, doesn't change. Well, again, remember, we have some flexibility to measure that. It has to go from the eave to the, the midpoint between the eave and the ridge as long as it's not occupied. But right now, that's... So we right. limit the hotel to that, that yeah. regardless. Yeah, that's fine. I don't know how long you folks want to carry on this this evening. And, and Maureen, have we covered, do you think, the parts of this draft that or you know, it's, it's up to you. Are you comfortable? My thought was if you're comfortable sending this to a public hearing in March, you would st I would make all the changes that you've talked about, which frankly aren't that many, and I would still provide you with an updated version for the May 3rd workshop in case you wanted to have another shot at it. Or the March 3rd workshop. I'm sorry, the March 3rd <laughs> workshop would be probably the better timing. <laughs> I'm fine with that. Yep. Is everybody happy with that approach? I think so. Okay, well, that's. Uh, we need a motion. We need a motion. Would you like you, a motion? And I guess I never wrote you a motion. No, that's there. right. The the motion would be to then. Well, well, we have one last thing. We don't know when the March public hearing. Well, well we can just the put it to March. The motion table it to the regular March planning board meeting at which time the public hearing will right. be held. She yes. just said that. <laughs> okay. You want me to stumble through it? Sure. Well, Jeez, just before you, before you stumble, I mean, would it make sense now to just in within in the same motion to no. uh, move the meeting to the twenty third and no no why is that they're two separate subjects. Oh, I understand. But, okay, you want to make two motions? <laughs> I move that we table the land use amendments until for public hearing 
during our regularly scheduled March meeting. That's the best I can do. I'll second that. Thanks. <laughs> discussion? What is it? Excuse me, yes. It's, it's motion, second, and discussion in the second motion. In favor? It carries unanimously. Okay, now as to what that, the date of that meeting should be, could we address that before we forget? Um, it's the scheduled meeting is, regular meeting is the 17th. This has caused some problems for some of the members. And there's been a uh, informal discussion of moving it till Monday, March 23. Does anybody have a difficulty with that? No, sounds good. Okay, Carolyn, would you make another motion? Make a motion we move our March, regularly scheduled March meeting to March 23rd, which is a Monday. Mm, yes. Second? I'll second that. Okay. Uh, any discussion on the second in motion? All in favor? Carries unanimously. All righty. Um, one other thing that Maureen uh, suggested that I, I mentioned, we have a vacancy in the board. Uh, Liza has resigned, and we thank her for her long service to the board. And uh, the, there is a process for replacing people on town boards, which will be followed. But it's certainly appropriate if, if anybody um, on the board or in the public have ideas of who might be a, a good candidate. We wish that they would uh, make the person, talk to the person, have the person make their name known as, as a candidate because uh, the more applicants for this, the better. And if we know people we think would be well suited, we should encourage them. Don't they usually have a waiting list? I mean, I, I thought. No, they, they, it's a, they're going to undertake a process like they normally do. Oh. Yeah, they have interview rooms and, uh, and eventually. And anyone who's out there listening at this time. Oh, if you're still listening, you should join the board. <laughs> <laughs> well, the, we, the, uh, the, the, the telecast is still going, and, and hopefully there are <laughs> residents of the town who will hear this and, and think about it. Um, and I think that's all we have scheduled. Anybody else have any subjects they'd like to discuss? Entertain a motion to adjourn? Motion we adjourn. Second. Second. Favor? Done. We can now go off.